Be seated, please. This week, I was talking to a Calvinist person, and he tells me in Robertson recently, there was an older man who walked across the road, and uh, he fell, and a truck came and ran across him. He says, is that the will of God? So I'm coming from this point of view this morning where I have an axe to grind. And so through my lesson, if I appear to be grinding an axe, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> we, I want you to know that in Calvinistic South Africa, uh, we have a tendency, people in South Africa have a tendency to say it's God's will. Anything that bad happens. I don't for two seconds believe that it is a, it's God's will that a drunk drives over a child and kills a child. I don't believe that this older man, if it's a true story, I cannot see it being a true story, uh, falling and a truck rides over him. Why would the truck be driving at that speed? Uh, if you see an older person, you will slow down anyway. But anyway, if it, if it happens, I don't believe it is, it is God's will uh, that, that these things happen to us. We need to know, yes, and we're going to look this morning at some results of our own thinking and of our own actions uh, to, to show to us uh, some of the reasons of, uh, of uh, the suffering. We, we see in Genesis chapter uh, 22 that God tests Abraham. What was the test? The test was go and sacrifice your son. That was the test. Did Abraham sacrifice his son? The Hebrew writer says he, he has killed, he killed him in, in a way that he already, in his mind, he was sacrificing his son. And therefore, Abraham, he persevered. He stood up to the test. He honored God in that regard. In this way, we need to know that, uh, yes, God tests us. Book of James tells us very, very plainly, and this is what we have read this morning, that, uh, that in our in our struggles, we need to know that our faith is tested. We need to know, therefore, that struggling is a way that, especially for us as Christians, this is a time for us to rise and shine. That is a time for us to know and to show the world out there. Although we are suffering, we need to give honor and glory to God. We need to praise Him. What would be the, the reason for your hope? And this is the year of hope for us. What would be the reason for your hope that when trouble sometimes come that we fall apart and that we blaspheme and that we, that we have a lack of faith in God? That would not be the way to uphold our faith and to be setting the proper example for our Christians. And therefore, uh, I want to say to you this morning that number one is we need to know that suffering comes. It could be that God is testing your faith and he's saying to you, hang in there. I want you to be faithful. I want you to persevere under this trials. Number two, a reason for suffering could be because of the uh, uh, true accident, a true accident of, of nature. Oftentimes, uh, a, a tree will fall down and fall on sometimes on fall, fall on people. Um, uh, years ago, I was out on a country visit closer to the glass door, and the uh, heavy phones phones me out. I was so far in the boondocks, there without even the radio signal there. And uh, somebody had to drive and say, a tree fell on your house. I said, wow. And uh, one of the neighbor's trees, the big pine tree fell. Uh, we had somebody sitting in the shed and right in front of him, I mean, a meter in front of him, the tree came down. It must have been a horrific sight. In fact, it was a very, very large time he ever came to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> he was so scared of the Savior that he never came back again. Accidents of life happen. You know, gravity is a good thing. If we did not have gravity on earth, we would not have been able to walk around and to work like we do. However, if you're on a roof and you fell down, you, you know, there's, it's not the falling that's going to kill you. It's the hard stops that kills you. So there's a, the, the, we need to recognize that, that the, the law of gravity God has put the law of gravity in place. But if we violate the law of gravity or of motion, this is why accidents happen. And uh, we, we do not determine for this to happen, but it happens from time to time. And, and we cannot therefore say it is God who caused them to happen. 
It could very well be that the person who is in a high place um, did not practice the right rule. Uh, if you climb up a tree, you might have some equipment to keep you safe. These are some of the things that are in play that could bring uh, extenuating circumstances to the situation. God did not cause that. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 12 from verse 7, he makes a point that he, had, he was given a thorn in the flesh. The thorn in the flesh, he identifies, he says, it is a what? It is the messenger of Satan. You see, never at one time did he say, admit that God gave them that. He says, the messenger of Satan. He says, this was causing him to harass him. It caused him so much grief, so much difficulty. And this morning, I don't want to go into the, to, to the reasons of what or symptoms, what Paul had. Why did he say he had a thorn in the flesh? We simply don't know. I want to tell you that the result was that God, he prayed God three times and God said, no, I want you to be faithful in your situation. Stay faithful and stay true to, to what God uh, demands of you. Many of you are in situations, whether it be in your work situation. It might be in a family situation. It might be in a relationship with, with people who are abusing you. I am saying to you that God wants you to honor him because we have a God who is very much alive, who is very much alive, and he will help you through this time. Yet, on the other hand, this is why uh, a lot of the Calvinists would say this is because people have sinned. In, uh, punishment for sin is God's hand on people. In Jeremiah chapter 33, the passage that Brother Stevens read for us this morning and he worked through, it is very, very clear that Jeremiah tells the people the reason why Jerusalem is being besieged, the reason why the city is going to fall is because of the sins of those people. We See also in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. Beautiful story. You need to go see how Jezebel, the, the beauty queen of uh, the ancient empire of... Uh, uh, this is an, under the old, the, the northern kingdom. She and her husband, they violated God's law. And uh, we know that uh, Naboth was a very, very uh, righteous man. He had a beautiful vineyard and the king wanted that vineyard. Jezebel was the one to, to uh, bring accusations as a man, this man against him in such a way that he was murdered. And uh, then the king then received the ground that he wanted from Jezebel. Jezebel was a, a very, very evil person. And in Second uh, Kings chapter 9, verse 30, we recognize and we see how God deals with people. Here comes uh, the 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 prophet, yes, the angel of God, who God put in that, in that role, and he came, and uh, he came into the city. She, Jezebel knew, this is the time of my going. I tell you what, she knew that she was going to die, and she made the child beautiful, put all the lipsticks, and everything on, and uh, when uh, she came out, the, yeah, we, the prophet asked her, where is she? She came out in all of her beauty, and then they threw her down and she was killed, of course. This is how God deals with sin. We cannot, we need to know that if we uh, are punished in this life for something that we have done, it is not God's will. It is our, it is the concept of our work. It's the, the way we think, it's the way we talk, it's the way uh, we did things. Yet in Matthew chapter 27, we find that, that suffering could also be self-inflicted. Matthew chapter 27 from verse 3, we find that Judah, uh, Judas hanged himself. He was so cut up in his heart when he realized that he had betrayed God's son. When he fully came to realization that for 30 miserly pieces of silver, for one month's salary, I have murdered my savior. That he threw the silver back uh, to the, the high priest and his uh, cohorts. They said to him, 
This is your money. This is blood money. We you don't want this money in the temple. You take it back. You see then that he did not receive any pat in the back. He didn't receive any glory. Nothing. Only that agony. I have murdered the person with whom I walked three, three years. He was a friend. He was a co-worker. He was a person who ate with, who were in the same situations, all traveling with, companion with Jesus for three years. He saw the miracles. He was there when Jesus did these wonderful things. And yet he betrayed Jesus. As a result of that, he chose he chose to hang himself. And uh, this is, that was his choice. Peter betrayed Jesus. Not much difference, of course. He didn't betray Jesus. Uh, he didn't be deny Jesus uh, for, for 30 pieces of silver. But uh, there's not much difference. Yet, Peter, he was bitterly, he, fit, he felt in his heart so distraught. He then repented to God, and he then came to God, and uh, he, he repented of his sins. And uh, tonight, you will hear the extension of that story in John chapter 21, when Brother Matt Cook will preach on it. So I, 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 I want you to know that tonight you need to be listening. Brother Matt Cook is an excellent speaker. You know, you, you know where he came from? He was a big-time player. Big sports best. In the, in the United States. Top of the players. You know where he landed up? In California in the jail. He has a story to tell. You need to listen. Here is a person who is convicted by the Lord and how the Lord changed his heart and his life to such an extent that he could be a preacher of the gospel tonight. He will be talking about this principle where, where Jesus then reinstates Peter and says to him, I've got a job for you to do. You need to know that, yes, our, our struggles, our suffering could be self-inflicted. And this morning, we, we can see that uh, we will handle some of these self-inflicted uh, troubles that we are going through. Number one is uh, in... Uh, in Genesis chapter 25, go with me please to Genesis chapter 25. In Genesis 25, we find uh, Jacob's brother Esau, who, uh, who sold his birthright for uh, a pot of soup. I'm reading for you from verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, this lentil stew. <laughs> I'm finished, I'm hungry, man. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. The eldest person always had the birthright. The birthright of the elders was that if, say for instance, uh, in his case, there were only two sons. The inheritance of the dad would be split in, into three parts. And therefore, the double portion will go to the eldest. And uh, the, the, the youngest then will receive just the one portion. What was the meaning of that? Remember, they did not have the state support, and, and therefore, it was always the eldest son's responsibility then to look after the, the mama and to, to other siblings. And as a result of that, he received a double portion in order to achieve God's purpose in that. And so here we see then that Esau, re, you remember that they were twins? But he was, a, uh, Jacob was supposed to be born first, but Esau was born first. I don't know how this happened anyway. This is not the, I'm not the technical guy in this, in this field. The, the fact is that Esau was the eldest. The first right belonged to him. Jacob said to him, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is my, good, my birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. 
So he saw an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. It is a sad situation when we see how this person, he is uh, famished. He says, I need to have food right now. People who are fasting on a regular basis tells me that uh, the first three days are the worst. After three days, the hunger and the pain goes away. So this is, a, this is actually, he is still in the infant stages of, the, of, his, uh, f of the fasting period where he is so famished and where his whole body is crying out, I need food uh, right now. How do we apply Esau's problem to you and me? Many young people, uh, especially teenagers, want, they want reaction today. They want action today. They want what they want today. They're not going to wait till tomorrow or invest for later in life. As a result of that, they will make some choices at the young life that will influence their whole lifestyle. A lot of young people get married way too soon. And uh, as a result of that, they, they will pick up some problems later on in life. Hedy and I were fortunate that things worked far fast. So we, I, you know, okay, I will tell you, you know that Hedy was 17 years of age when we got married. I was only just about, just close to 22. Uh, the fact is that I was transferred from, from Pretoria and every weekend or once a month, I hitchhiked uh, to Pretoria and back. So it is a dangerous situation. You're looking for some problems in that in that regard. It was in the Air Force, and uh, the families came together. And we said, "Yeah, it's, it's fine. We were engaged anyway. So why don't we why don't we get married?" You need to know, as young people, uh, that uh, that thing that you need now, if you really evaluate, there's nothing that you really really need now except air and food. There are some things that are worth waiting for. Girls, when that guy uh, tells you, I need your body and I need it now, you tell him, you wait until there's a ring on our finger. And then, uh, and then we will talk again. Because there, there is a worth in waiting. There is a, for Esau, because he was interested in this short-term solution, he lost in the long run. Do not be. Let Esau then be for us a, a reason for how we to value the gifts that God has given us. We see that number two, that God, Israel abandoned God, abandoned God. We read in Judges, Judges chapter two, the following, that uh, that. In verses uh, 13 through 15, that because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherites in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to the enemies all around them, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them they were in great distress brother stephen this morning also in a was went to went to pains to explain to us in in uh, jeremiah chapter 33 and 34 how that that the whole city of jerusalem was besieged by by nebuchadnezzar and therefore, God tells them, it's no use. You are fighting against me when you are fighting them because you are being punished for your sins. Israel abandoned God. And therefore, the outcome was that your sin will find you out. How does that relate to us? If we resist God, I want you to know that we're going to come second. There comes a time when God will not listen to our petition anymore. There comes a time when it will be useless and futile for us to come to God because God is saying, if you don't want to repent, if you don't want to turn, how can I strengthen you in your difficult times? The third point I want to talk about this morning are rash promises. In Judges chapter 11, this to me is a very, very sad story. And I believe that 
still, however, many people practice what is happening. Here is this man, Jephthah, and he's making a vow uh, to God to do something which he later on will, uh, will uh, really, really, it'll come to haunt him. We see in verse 22, uh, from, let's read from the 21. Then the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, gave Shion and all of his men into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites that lived in the country, capturing all of it uh, from the Anon to the Jack Jabbok and from the desert of Jordan. I think that uh, I have the wrong text here. Somehow or another, I am reading from Je Okay, I'm reading, should read from verse 22. I'm sorry. 32. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. From verse 32, then Jephthah went over to the fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from, uh, from uh, Arur to the vicinity of Mineth, and as far as Abel Kerishim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. And after, and Jephthah returned to his home in Jephthah. And who should come out to meet him? His daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines. She was an only child, except that for her, he had neither son nor daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and he cried, Oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched because I made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. We see that the vow was that uh, uh, in verse 30, the verse 30, Jephthah made the vow to the Lord, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from Ammonite will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt, burnt offering. What a, what a sad situation. Jephthah is saying, I am in great distress. I am anxious. There is a big mountain ahead of me. How do I handle this? Instead of trusting God, he is making arrangements with God. If you help me, if you do this, this is what I will do. They tell me up in, in Portugal especially, there are some big uh, monuments and even some monuments uh, depicting Jesus Christ. And people, you will see people crawling up and down there, sometimes on their knees. And the reason is that they have made a vow. Now, Lord, if you give me something in my life, if you give me a car, I will crawl up this thing three or six times, or how many every time. And this is what people are doing today. People are living like this, where they are making empty vows to God. I was a preacher in Tennessee years ago, and uh, somebody told me, there's a young man in the congregation who had marital problems, and he said that if his wife comes back to him, he will come forward and he will make a public statement and he will preach a sermon about the situation. And, uh, well, I waited for him to come. I waited and I waited and I waited. After the situation was resolved, his wife was back to him. He didn't come up. And so I confronted him. I said, hey, brother, you have a view. Come on, now. Can I help you? That you need to to commit yourself to this vow that you have made. You need to know that we make a vow to God. We, we are not talking to ordinary uh, ordinary person here. We are making an eternal vow to the Savior. And therefore, as Christians, let us not make vows that we cannot keep. Let us not make vows that will go against the, the grain of God. God cannot be tempted. God, You cannot play. Uh, strong arm tactics with the Lord and say, this is what I'm going to do, and I want you to do that. Uh -uh. This is not how God operates. God said, you listen to me, and I will supply your needs. Last of all, I want to go and uh, read Second Samuel chapter 6. Maybe what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you what is happening here. This is at the height of, of David. David is writing, and uh, you will know that under Eli, the ark of the Lord was stolen by uh, the Philistines. And now uh, David says, we need the Ark of the Covenant needs to be in Jerusalem, it needs to get back here. And so uh, he sent brand new ox, new sleigh, everything to go and fetch the Ark of the Covenant. And Uzzah was the person who brought, brought the Ark back. But at one stage, the 
the, uh, it looked like the, the, the ark was going to fall off of the sleigh, and Uzzah then took, and he, uh, he supported it. He prevented it from falling over, and as a result of that, uh, he was killed. We say, how wrong can that be? How can a righteous God do that kind of thing? You know what happened? Is God in the beginning said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to build this ark, and this is what you're going to put inside. And this is how you're gonna use this is how you're gonna carry it. You're gonna carry it four people, two in the front, two in the back, and they're gonna put the rings through it, and you carry the wood. You don't touch the ark, you only touch the poles. And only uh, a certain segment of the Levites could do that. Now, as a result of this ark being away, it was such a long distance. Maybe they said this was too long a distance. To carry. It could be. Maybe maybe they reason well. Maybe God will not. Because it's a temporary situation. Maybe God will excuse us. Good, Maybe good reasoning. But it's not what happened. Because they violated God's law. Uzzah died. How do we apply it for today? There are many people. Who will twist God's scriptures. And they will apply various things from scriptures and say, this is how we're going to do it today. We cannot hope to have the promises of God if we are building on a false premise. If we are not obeying God's laws, we are going to be like as a, we're going to touch the ark and we will be killed as a result of that. My friends, it is recognized that when we come to God, we need to honor him as God. We need to come with our hearts being right. We need to worship him in, in truth. We need to worship him in spirit so that we need to know that God is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the one who is everywhere. He is the one who is knowing our thoughts. And on this basis, my, my wishes, my prayer is that mankind will saw, will see that denominationalism is not what God requires. God and wants his children to worship him in the way uh, that he would want to worship him. And therefore, my prayer is that uh, when we come together to worship, that we will ask, what is it that God would want from this worship service? Never, never, ever do we see in the Bible uh, that uh, we need to be gratified as a result of worship. The problem that the the, the the point of worship, why we are here this morning, is to bring praise to God. It's not for us. We are not the main manna what counts in the situation. God is the one who needs to be honored. And in this way, we need to worship God on his terms and not on our terms. Denominationalism is not acceptable for God. God wants us to worship in truth. And therefore, let us bring our worship offerings to him in the acceptable way, in the way that he would want it to do, because there is a way to worship truth fully. But they also, the Bible talks about vain worship. And that vain worship is when we are not doing what God would want us to do. Honor God by our total obedience, by saying, Lord, you are king of kings. I want to submit my will to you. And therefore, as a result of that, God will bless you. May Uzzah be for us a reason to know that we cannot make our own rules regarding worship. We need to submit to what God has put out for us there. And therefore, the lesson is yours this morning. We are all going through suffering. Suffering is a fact of life. Not only Christians suffer, non-Christian suffers as well. Suffers, they suffer as well. And therefore, let us recognize that my suffering, it could be that I'm going through a, a testing of a faith period. It could be that this is I'm going through an accident of life. It could be that it was a messenger of Satan that is tormenting me. It could be that, yes, that I am facing punishment for sin that I committed. But it could also be that I am in a situation where I am... I have self-inflicted this punishment upon me, and therefore I am suffering as a result of uh, my own wrongdoing. Whatever the state 
of your suffering. Let us not ask so much the how, why. Let us say, how can I shine and how can I honor God through this? Moses, because he was in a situation of grief, while he was grieving for his sister, the next chapter we see that is the time when he rebelled. He, instead of speaking to the rock, he hit the rock with his staff. And as a result of that, this faithful man, he was punished. His punishment was, you are not allowed to go into the promised land. You need to know that you and I, let us honor God and ask not why, but saying, yes, Lord, I want to, I want to be involved with your kingdom. All of Jesus' apostles died unnatural death, except John, who died even in jail. And therefore, yes. It is a reality. Suffering is a reality for Christians. And therefore, let us, like Paul uh, told Timothy, know that if we are living a righteous life before Christ, we will suffer. But let us suffer as God's children. Let us be obedient in our suffering uh, to God and his commandments. It might be that you know that you have to obey the gospel, but you have never done it. This morning is your opportunity. Why not today? Why not today say, I want to honor God in everything. Because if you are not, if we are not, we are resisting God. It might be that you have sinned in such a way that you need a public apology. You need to tell the people out there, I have sinned against God. I have sinned against my family, against my people. I want to honor God. It might be that the public confession is necessary. It might be that this morning you just want to praise God. You want to thank him for what he has done. Uh, and this morning, of course, we are praising God once again because of our sister's uh, good news uh, that she has heard about the cancer. Let us know that this hymn of invitation is therefore a call for us to think about our situation and to honor God in what we are doing. Shall we stand and sing this invitation song?